Hello and welcome to this Union Solidarity International News Update. My name is Walton Pantland and with me is Andrew Brady. Today we're talking about our project in the brick kilns of India, about the UN vote on Palestine, about factory fires in Bangladesh, about the wave of strike action that's hit the United States, and a number of other really important stories. But first, Andrew, let's have an update on what's happening in India. Thank you, Walton, and really delighted that because of our endeavours over the last six or seven months in developing a social media platform that has credibility that people are engaging in and participating in. As a result of our work, we've been able to raise the finances necessary to cover the costs of our brick kiln project in India, which I want to thank everybody who has supported that campaign, he has given it oxygen and is financially donated to that, particularly through our branch affiliation strategy. And on that note, if your union branch or local or trades council, whatever union entity it may be, has not affiliated yet, then we would encourage you to do so precisely because it builds union power. Walton, we have been featuring this and will continue to on our social media streams about how we're talking to the the union organisers, the, the branch secretaries, the union structures that are being put in place within several states of India to expand the work of union organising. It's not just about union organising, Walton, which is the bread and butter of what USI is about. It's also about how it enables the workers' families and their children to access social services such as health and education. And it's about those wider societal issues as well as the union organising that we are very, very proud to have played a part in this project and working with our partners Preyas. So thank you for all your support and all your efforts to get this campaign widely circulated in social media streams and to also to ask you to continue to support the project because what we would love to do is to expand the work that has already been put in place and is underway. What we would love to do is to be able to extend that 7,000 workers to maybe 10,000 workers to trans to help transform the lives of working people. That's what USI wants to be about. We want to build union capacity and to build union power as well as being a platform for other organisations and getting their message of trade unionism and social justice out to a wider issue. So it's brilliant, genuinely brilliant. We're delighted at USI, aren't we, Walton, that we've been able to raise the sums that helps transform the lives of people. So Now, it was just a couple of months ago that we wrote about the brutality of the fashion industry, the factory fires in Pakistan, the brutality, the worker unrest, the murder of union activists in Bangladesh, and also the exploitation faced by models who use their faces and bodies to sell clothes. We also spoke about alternatives, about fair labour standards and ethical fashion, and about the South African Union that's trying to transform the industry. Now we have to speak about it again because there has been another terrible factory fire at the Tazreen fashion factory in Bangladesh where around 200 workers were burned to death. Now, as usual, these are workers who were working long hours in unsafe conditions, producing clothing for major Western brands, and once again, they were locked into the factory by their supervisors who were attempting to meet production quotas. Now, it's very important to ensure fair labor standards in places like Bangladesh and Pakistan, but it's also really important that we put pressure on the companies that buy these products because these are items of clothing that end up on our high street and which we, we buy. In this particular instance, the Tazreen factory was making clothing for Walmart, Disney, and the Edinburgh Woolen Mill. So very important to keep, keep that pressure up because it's horrific that things like this still happen. It's more than 100 years after the shirtwaist, Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire in New York where 146 young women were killed and which led to such public outrage that health and safety and labor standards became law in the US. 100 years later, we're still dealing with this in parts of the developing world and it really has to end. It's an absolute tragedy and a preventable tragedy. Yeah, I mean, what we've seen over the weekend is absolutely sickening. Mm -hmm. Absolutely sickening. How many times do we need to listen and watch the news, to 
to hear these incidents happening time after time after time. Hundreds and hundreds of innocent people losing their lives because they are working for companies who are making tens of millions of dollars and pounds and euros, whatever the currency may be, and they can't afford bloody fire exits. It's as simple as that. And you've seen the press over the last couple of days how the management of the, the factory have said that we blame us because we didn't put in fire exits. Mm -hmm. and it's just astounding. I, I just can't, I can't find the words to describe how angry I feel mm -hmm. about this. And it's happening time after time. We see it month after month. And when the hell are these companies who Walton has referred to, their names, going to put pressure on their supply chains to help save lives. Yeah. And it also shows what happens when you win the race to the bottom. Because this is where neoliberalism is leading us. Bangladesh is the country that's won the race to the bottom. It's got the lowest wages in the world and it's got the lowest conditions. It Race to the bottom means that people work long hours, don't get enough money to live and get burned to death in factories. I don't think that's a race we want to be taking part in. Instead of a race to the bottom, we need to be climbing to the top and we need to ensure fair labor standards across the world and social justice for everyone. Which, is a, which brings us on to the US where there's been a very, very interesting wave of industrial unrest over the, the past couple of years. We've reported on some of it, the Chicago teachers, the Verizon workers, the Con Ed uh, utility workers in New York. But what's really interesting is how precarious workers are increasingly taking action. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, we saw a very, very interesting wave of strike action across Walmart stores in the US, uh, which culminated in a Black Friday strikes and protested in more than 100 cities in the US. It's the first time there's been successful union action in Walmart, and that is a, it's a big deal. It's important. It means there's a real shift in what's happening among precarious workers in the US and their attempts to unionize. And uh, something else really significant that happened just recently in New York Fast food work workers walked out of McDonald's, Burger King, Taco Bell, and uh, KFCs in protest at low wages. They're demanding a living wage for New York and the right to unionize without interference. So uh, for me, it's really fantastic to see this new wave of industrial action and militants and people standing up for their, ri their, their rights in the, the heart of uh, the capitalist empire, if you like. It's, uh, yeah, it's encouraging. It's, it's very encouraging. I mean, we've been following this for a number of months now, including Palermo's Pizza's dispute that we continue to support, and this wave of union defiance. And it's happening because of the pressure that has been put on unions in America and union members. I mean, we're talking about the race to the bottom in, in relation to Bangladesh. The same thing's happened in America. Let's, mm -hmm. let's not, you know hide behind that as well. Although the level of wages are far, far higher, of course, than in countries like Bangladesh and Vietnam and countries where there's a strong textile and garment sector, the wage depreciation and depression in America is absolutely startling as well and people are walking out because they've had enough. Mm -hmm. And what's been fascinating about it is the the element of how union activists have been utilising social media to garner support and to get people involved in the campaigns, particularly with Walmart, which was really fascinating to see in a great graphic about where stores, there was protests mm. outside. It was like watching election night, except where union members were actually taking action and walking out in Walmart stores and it was really great to see that that level of utilization of social media because it enables us to feel part of it to really gain an understanding about where the action's taking place and what are the reasons for that action but it's been really heartening to see that union members in America despite the amount of pressure that they're being put under have said enough is enough now back to the UK, for the past 142 years, the Durham Miners Gala has been a fantastic celebration of working class and trade union culture. It's the biggest celebration of community values in Britain today, and anyone who's taken part will bear witness to the incredible atmosphere and sense of collective celebration and strength. It's a stirring experience to witness the parade of brass and pipe bands, the mass banners of the great industrial armies um, of our working class communities. It's a, it's, 
an articulation of a very different kind of big society, one founded on solidarity and fraternity. However, the gala is in trouble because it costs money to organize this increasingly popular event, and the Durham Miners Association is asking for your support to help make sure that this event continues to inspire a new generation of trade union activists. We'll put a link uh, on the website for you. Please go to the Durham Miners Association and sign up as a friend of the gala for a small amount of money and make sure that this event continues for the future. Andrew, um, I'm interested, I, I know you've been following the story of uh, the UN vote on, on Palestine and uh, in the wake of the recent brutality we saw in Gaza, I think that's interesting. What are your views on what's happened there? Well, of course, there was the vote to the UN General Assembly to upgrade the status of Palestine, and it was very heartening to see the level of support in the UN General Assembly, and only nine countries and nations voting against the, the upgrading of the status of Palestine. Of course, this is an issue that's been going for centuries, uh, but the, the vote has been very important in making the Palestinian people feel that the world has a sense of solidarity with them and of course it changes very little on the ground and the conditions for people but hopefully that this is symbolic and that it helps people feel that their nation is getting more support in the world and that people are actually watching and caring and listening about what is going on, particularly in the Gaza Strip, but in Palestine in general. Mm -hmm. So it was a really historic moment to watch it on the news and in particular to watch it on different news organisations to see how they were covering it and you know the the shame of those countries who voted against mm -hmm. the the status of Palestine being upgraded. So it was a really, it was really fascinating and heartening to watch. And we only hope that the the people, particularly of Gaza, feel that the world cares about them and is listening and showing solidarity with them. And perhaps that that vote is a small symbolic gesture in that in that sense. Yeah, it seems like a turning of the the diplomatic tide. And um, I mean, I think we can add to the shame of those who voted against, also the shame of those who abstained from Absolutely. the vote, because. Um, a number of countries did, and yet they clearly out of step with the, the vast majority of world opinion. It's, uh, I think, 135 countries voted in favour of recognition, so there's a turning of the diplomatic tide which we, we desperately hope leads to a genuine, just and lasting peace in Israel and Palestine, and uh, friendship and fraternity for everyone who lives in the region. Um, now, a solidarity call from the International Transport Workers Feder Federation, their affiliate in Turkey, uh, Tumtis has been attempting to organize at DHL and DHL have not been playing playing along nicely. DHL have been uh, making things very, very difficult. So there's a call for action on 12-12-12, the 12th of December 2012. Uh, the, the ITF is asking for solidarity action from unions around the world, particularly around DHL. So send off protest messages to DHL, pick it outside DHL offices, or do something to communicate to this multinational and very wealthy company that we don't tolerate interference in the right to organize and that DHL workers in Turkey have the right to form a union and to have independent representation. Andrew, that's all I have this week. Do you have anything you want to add? Yes, just one more thing, Walton, uh, to thank everybody who has stayed the course in this YouTube link and also this iTunes download. But we'd also like to encourage you as a trade unionist, as a progressive, as a student who would like to participate within USI, perhaps by writing an article, by forwarding and uploading photographs of protests against austerity and against attacks on organised labour, to participate in web conferences with us in different areas of the globe so that we can make our message more relevant, more varied, more diversified so if you are interested in playing some small role it doesn't matter how small or how large we welcome your participation because we really are only what you make us 
by your participation, by your enthusiasm and engagement within our project. So please get in touch with us via our contact page on our website at usilive.org and get in touch with Walton and myself about how you perhaps could get involved in help building union power across our world. Send us a good picture and we'll put it right here. Once again, thank you for listening and watching and solidarity from USI.